What does a physical chemist like me, more precisely a thermodynamicist, mean when he talks about systems, state functions, path functions and the like? How does a thermodynamicist see the world? That is exactly what it should be about today. Hello and welcome to FISCAM Basics. Today it's all about systems and processes you'll hopefully get an impression of a thermodynamicist's view of the world. Let the well-known oxyhydrogen reaction be one of the light motives for this course. Hydrogen and oxygen react to form water, which is formulated by a regular chemist in this way. But this is by no means enough for physical chemistry, because physical chemistry is about describing everything with numbers. That means, at the end of the day, we have a jumble of numbers that describe this very process in every detail. During this course we will get to know these numbers bit by bit. Let's start with the reactants. Oxyhydrogen, that is two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen, are in a container and this container is referred to as system by physical chemistry. A thermodynamic system is a part of the physical universe with a specified boundary which separates it from the surroundings. Our system here now needs to be described and, as you may guess, completely described with numbers. Well, let's start with two numbers. Uh, we can, for example, specify the mass of the system, in this case 36 grams, and we may specify the volume, about 70 liters. Mass and volume are two of plenty of quantities, physical quantities, that describe the properties of the system. And we call these state variables or state functions. Many of these state variables are known from everyday life, like temperature and pressure. Thermodynamics adds a number of other state functions, just properties, for practical reasons the most important ones being H, S and G, enthalpy, entropy and Gibbs free energy. These are properties which are related to the energy of a system, a core business of thermodynamics. We'll get to know these new state functions later, but for now just consider them as properties of the system just like any other property. In science, there are two prerequisites for introducing new quantities. They have to make sense and they have to be measurable. They are often neither clear nor understandable, but that is not the point. Question. How many numbers, how many state properties do we need to describe our system completely? Mr. Gibbs, one of the greatest thermodynamicists of all times, has set up a rule for this. In fact, it's a law the simplest law of thermodynamics. F equals C minus P plus 2. That skips phase rule. If the system consists of C components and P phases, then you need exactly F state variables to unambiguously describe the system. In oxyhydrogen gas, there are two components, hydrogen and oxygen, two different types of particles. There is just one phase, one homogeneous region, the gaseous phase. We do the math, F equals 3. It needs three state variables to clearly describe the system. No less and no more. We can choose them freely. That's why F is called degree of freedom. For example, specification of temperature, pressure, composition does completely describe the system. The product water, again a system, consists of only one component, H2O. It also consists of only one phase, liquid. That is, we only need two state variables, for example temperature and pressure, are sufficient to clearly specify this pure substance. All other state variables, all other properties are set so to speak, automatically by nature. Since two state variables are sufficient to specify all possible states of a pure substance, all of these states can be represented 
on a two-dimensional surface. And here it is. This surface in PVT space, the so-called phase diagram of a one-component system. The surface is sometimes more and sometimes less curved. There are discontinuities and interesting points and lines, which we will discuss later. It is intended to be another light motif through most of this series of lectures. Back to our oxyhydrogen gas reaction. We have described the reactants thermodynamically and also described the products with state variables like P, T and X. And now we are going to describe the reaction, the process from initial state I to final state F. A process is always a change of condition, a change of state. In this case, a chemical change of state and is described by a delta. Delta Z means change of the state variable Z from initial value, Z initial, to the final value, Z final. It is defined as Z sub final minus Z sub initial. For example, delta V equals V final minus V initial. Or delta T equals T final minus T initial. Of course, the state variable can also be constant. For example, if the pressure remains constant, then we have a so-called isobaric process. P final equals P initial, delta P equals zero. Uh, let's take a look at these new state functions. What is, for example, enthalpy? Enthalpy is the measure of how much energy is contained in the system. And we can look up the enthalpy of our chemical players at thermodynamic tables that are given in many textbooks. Hydrogen and oxygen both have enthalpy zero. That is, in total, our reactant oxyhydrogen has enthalpy zero. At first glance, this might seem strange. In fact, the elements were arbitrarily chosen as a zero point for the enthalpy. The product water, on the other hand, is significantly lower in enthalpy, negative 572. So in the process here, the enthalpy is decreasing. It is said to be an exothermic process. The enthalpy of reaction, delta H, is negative. The enthalpy of reaction is a measure of how the energy changes in a process. In this case, negative 572 kilojoules. We can also consider another thermodynamic quantity, which is even less clear, namely the chaos, the entropy S. Again, we will find the entropy of many substances in textbooks. We will find an entropy of 466 joules per Kelvin for the reactants, the oxyhydrogen gas. This is quite a high entropy, while well, gases are pretty chaotic. The entropy of liquid water, on the other hand, is only 140 joules per Kelvin. The product clearly is much more orderly. This means the entropy decreases during the process, a so-called exotropic process. Considering H and S is a typical thermodynamic view of a process. Remember that new state functions need to make sense. H and S do make sense because we can formulate the main principles of thermodynamics, the first and the second law, very easily using them. Another thermodynamic quantity, the Gibbs free energy G, is particularly important. The free energy of a compound is often referred to as its chemical potential, Mi, and is a measure of instability. Again, we find these values in many chemistry textbooks. The instability of oxyhydrogen is zero. Again, an arbitrary zero level. The instability of water is negative 474 kilojoules. This means water is much less unstable, much more stable than oxyhydrogen. The instability goes down. It's a so-called hexagonic process. Delta G, also tells us something about affinity of a process. A number that shows us quantitatively the driving force of a process. The oxygen-hydrogen gas reaction has a considerable affinity. To summarize again, a process can be described 
thermodynamically with the state function of its initial state and the state functions of its final state. In order to successfully apply the laws of thermodynamics on a process, in fact there are only four of them in total, these state functions should include enthalpy, entropy and Gibbs free energy. From everyday life uh, we are familiar with two other energy quantities, heat and work. These are to be understood a little differently by thermodynamics. Heat and work are no properties of a system, no state variables. They are two types of energy exchange between system and surroundings. In thermodynamics, heat and work are called path functions and there is a strict sign convention for them. When work is done on a system, there is energy input from the surroundings to into the system. And it looks like this. Then the path function work has a positive sign, W greater 0. The same holds for heat. When a system absorbs heat, the heat has a positive sign. This is by the way called an endothermic process. In the opposite case, the system may submit work or release heat to the surroundings, W less than 0, Q less than 0, also called an exothermic process. Consider we want to heat 1 liter of water from 0 centigrade to 100 centigrade, because we want to make tea. This is the process in which the system, the water, absorbs energy as heat. It's an endothermic process. We could measure this heat by using this known equation from physics, Q equals C times delta T. C is the heat capacity, delta T is the temperature difference, final temperature minus initial temperature. This heat is a so-called sensitive heat because this heat goes along with the change in temperature. Plugging in the heat capacity of water and the temperature change, we end up with 418 kilojoules. We need 418 kilojoules of heat to heat up one liter of water from 0 to 100 centigrade. If we further supply heat to the water, the temperature of water will no longer rise. The water will evaporate. This heat of evaporation is not linked to a temperature change and is called latent heat. Let's talk about work. You may remember the equation from physics, work is force times distance. With electrical work, this equation translates to work equals voltage times current times time. Consider charging your smartphone via the 5 volts 1 amp USB connection of your computer for 6 hours. Then you would transfer 108 kilojoules of work to the cell phone's battery. This energy corresponds roughly to the heat required for two cups of tea. In thermodynamics, pressure volume work is particularly important. Whenever the volume of a system changes, becomes smaller or becomes larger, we have to take into account PV work. External pressure exerts a force on the system. If its volume changes, this force acts upon a certain distance. So the classical equation work equals force times distance translates into pressure volume work equals negative external pressure times delta V. In the oxyhydrogen reaction, volume decreases from almost 75 liters to 36 milliliters. So delta V will be negative 75 liters. With an external pressure of 100 kilopascals, we end up with PV work of plus 7.4 kilojoules. During the oxyhydrogen reaction, the atmosphere compresses the system, adding 7.4 kilojoules of work on it, so to speak, free of charge. Let's get it all together. We define the state functions of the initial and final state, and we define work and heat as path functions. Work and heat are referred to in this way because heat and work actually depend on the path. In contrast, the state functions are always the same, no matter what path we go. The numbers for work and heat, however, may vary a lot. Let's discuss two paths of carrying out the oxyhydrogen reaction. The spontaneous path in an oxyhydrogen torch and the reversible path in a fuel cell. 
PV work will be the same in both paths because we always go from 75 liters to almost volume zero at atmospheric pressure. But with a torch, we get a lot of heat. 572 kilojoules, but no further useful work. With the fuel cell, the very same reaction releases much less heat, only 98 kilojoules. But in addition, we will get a considerable amount of electrical work, 474 kilojoules. In fact, that's what a fuel cell is for, gaining electrical energy. So when dealing with path functions, work and heat, you always have to specify the path of the process, often as an index to the letters W and Q. For example, Q sub P stands for isobaric path or W sub ref stands for reversible path. Let's summarize. Thermodynamicists investigate systems. Thermodynamicists describe the state of a system with state variables and also invent new state variables, enthalpy, entropy and free energy, to apply the universal laws of thermodynamics. Thermodynamicists call the change of a state a process and describe it quantitatively using delta quantities of state functions and the path functions work and heat. As work and heat are path dependent, the exact path of the process has to be specified. We discussed a few equations. Gibbs phase rule to calculate the degrees of freedom of a system, the equation for calculating the sensitive heat, and the equations for calculation of electrical and pressure volume work. More information about the topic you'll find in the book and in the lecture. Thanks for watching.